Okay. We are recording. All right. So um, for anyone who's joining us uh, after the fact, I wanted to go over a couple of just high level core concepts so that you know what you're watching. Um, this is a braid code walkthrough and braid is a um, it's basically a vision to invite people to have a standard synchronization method on the internet. And uh, the way I think about that is to make uh, cooperative computing easier. So um, we're going to look at two libraries today that are connected to the, uh, or conform to the braid 03 specification. So this is braid over HTTP. And uh, probably going to spend about 20 minutes in each library. It won't be a complete code walkthrough but um, it will kind of get our feet wet, have, a, have an idea of what each library is like. Um, and I am, uh, I'm Dwayne Johnson. I work at uh, the Braid Foundation and I think of my role as like human-centered thinking plus software development. So we'll see, uh, see if that passes muster over the next few months as things change and everything's, uh, everything's fun in a small startup, so. Um, so there are some pretty uh, clear similarities between Braid.js and the Braid protocol. Um, they both provide a client and a server. They're both uh, oriented towards um, Node.js and the web browser environment. Uh, hey, Angelo, welcome. And um, they both conform to the Braid 03 spec. So that's sort of the, the broad general similarities. Um, I think there are some differences in values that each project has. So I'll just highlight those briefly before I go into the code. Um, Braid.js, which also I believe is changing its name to Braidify. That's the case, Mike? I think Braid.js is the repository, the monorepo. Braidify is one of the, is a package you can use within that. Perfect, okay, thanks for clarifying. I was wondering about that. So Braid.js and Braidify uh, specifically is um, taking the approach of kind of Let's enhance what exists. So um, let's polyfill the ecosystem. Um, it's easy to experiment and, uh, and try out new protocol changes there. Um, the values include, um, let's make this plain JavaScript with no build step. So again, it's really easy to change things in and out. Um, and there are as few abstractions as possible. Um, the braid-protocol library, I would say it's general principle is let's let's try solid engineering principles. So um, it's going to be a foundation for other libraries. Um, let's make it well tested and well typed. So uh, that's my impression of those two libraries so far. So uh, okay, let's, let's jump into the code. I will share my screen here. Uh, desktop one. Okay. Okay, so Braidify. Um, let's uh, actually just before we start in the code itself, let me orient us in terms of uh, where we're looking. So this is a this is the Braid.js GitHub repo. Um, you can see it's got the Braidify kernel sync nine and util folders. We're going to focus mainly on this Braidify section, which is the protocol. Um, these other aspects are in development. I wouldn't say that they're quite ready for a code review, but um, I'd be excited to for anyone who wants to show a code review at some point. Uh, okay, and then um, the other library that we're going, uh, going to be looking at later in about 20 minutes is um, Braid-Protocol. So we'll focus on Braidify for now. Any questions so far? Good, cool, okay. Um, so we have the Braidify client and server. I'm gonna start in the server um, it's a little bit easier to understand the server because it's what's uh, generating the responses. So um, spe specifically the, the stream of, of things that are uh, being subscribed to. And um, to clarify that a bit, I do have a little bit of a, let's see. Yeah, okay. So these are um, requests and responses uh, that would be braid, 03 spec compatible. And um, here would be a request from a client to a server uh, asking for a change or an update to that content um, 
So this would be a change that appends a messages array um, with this content, author Dwayne content. Hey, how's it, Braden? Um, things to note, this uh, request is uh, regular HTTP up until the second set of headers, which is now an update. We're gonna be going through that in both Braid JS and Braid protocol libraries. Uh, and then um, I want to also show that there are three tiers possible. So here's another example. This is a subscribe get. So this would be uh, from the from the client's perspective. What they're seeing is um, they're sending a oh, sorry. Yeah, the, the get already happened. So here's the get from the client perspective. And then the response here is um, it's confirming it's a subscribe and then we get a whole bunch of chunked updates. And these things contain either complete, uh, complete, con uh, complete body, a complete record of the whole resource or updates and patches. Um, so here is an example of an update that has, uh, that's replacing the content. And then here's an example of an update that has a patch with, uh, again, inserting something inside of the JSON uh, with this content. And you can see that patches can come in multiple patches. So in this case, the update has two patches, patch one, patch two. Okay, so that's the structure of the information encoding that we're trying to do in the braid protocol request response cycle. And let's go back to the code now. So this is braid JS. So um, I'm gonna start with this, uh, Braidify. So just let's see here. Overall structure. We can actually look at the outline here. So the overall structure of this Braidify server is it has a Braidify function and then generate patches, parse patches, and send version. Um, so let's look at Braidify. Any questions? Still good? I'll assume silence is yes. Okay, so um, so the Braidify function is middleware in uh, the regular response cycle of uh, of an HTTP server. So it's respect it's expecting a request and response, and then a next, which basically is uh, handing control over to the next middleware. Um, so here we are checking the regular HTTP headers, version, request, um, the parents, the peer, which is, I believe, not part of the spec, but something that's necessary in order to keep hold on the subscription so that you send the same uh, follow-up data to the peer that you've identified or that it has identified for itself with a unique identifier. Um, so again, this is different than say a regular get where a response happens after a single response happens after a single request. This would be a request followed by many responses. So that's why the subscription needs to be made. So we're holding on to, but we're assuming that there's a subscription at first. If there isn't, then that means that this is a regular, uh, the regular get. And I believe that's handled later. Uh, I'm not sure it made it actually, I think in this case, Braid.js requires you to handle it yourself. So we'll, we'll take a look at that. Um, but if it, if it does subscribe, then that means that we have to hold on to the subscriber uh, who's, who's, who's listening. Um, and that happens, I'm gonna skip down a little bit here at start subscription. So the expected uh, the expected way that this API is called is that, uh, let's go to some actual code where it's being used. Uh, oh, maybe I don't have it open. Here we go. Here's a ribbon example. Uh, start subscription. So here's an example where it's being used. Um, the feed would be requested and in its response, it would check to see if the 
uh, client has asked for a subscribe. This would be the subscribe keep alive for now. If it has, then we call response.start start subscription. And this is where uh, we pay attention to and keep track of this particular subscriber so that we can get a handle on them and keep responding to them over and over again. So the initial send version here is just a one-time thing, but uh, later on, we're going to be keeping track of the subscriptions and, and responding to them more. So let's see, back to Bradify. Okay, so everyone okay still? Make sure I'm not just talking to myself. Yeah. Um, I've got a quick question actually. So you just showed the code that you used it. Um, yes. So that code's got the Bradify code somewhere. Um, like that router's got the Bradify uh, middleware installed somewhere, right? Is that, That's right. Is that how it works? Yes. Let me right. uh, show the actual server code. So this is mm -hmm. this is like what you would expect a regular Express JS server to look like. We create the mm -hmm. Express object. And then we add middleware, in this case, right. cores and Bradify. So any request, I mean, at least in the server, any request that has subscribe keep alive is going to um, have a subscription object inside the request. That's right. Um, oh, great. Any, any request will get a subscribe uh, field that will tell you if it's a subscription request. Right. It'll just tell you Boolean. Yeah. And then you can just decide whether or not to create the, description, the subscription. So even if, if a request comes in and says subscribe, keep alive, uh, the server can decide it doesn't want to uh, obey that. It's like, no, I'm not going to give you a subscription. So you have to still write start subscription, and that'll start the subscription. Cool. That makes sense. Nice. Thanks. Cool. Thanks for clarifying. Mike, that was good. So. Uh, it marked, like you were saying, Mike, this marks it as a subscription. So is subscription gets set to true. And then uh, we're preparing for a status code of 209, which uh, is, this is part of the headers that are um, in the response object. Um, it's strange in some browsers, you don't actually get to see the status code until the, uh, until the response completes. So you never get to see the status code, <clears throat> but it does show that in the top of the header before, uh, before all the chunks start uh, streaming. Uh, here we have the subscribe header and cache control. So uh, these are set for you. It's, I think, a convenience thing. I don't know that this is necessary. And actually, uh, my one thought here, I was, think I was looking up no cache, and I think we might want no store. Uh, I'm not sure, though. It might be a ticket for later. Um, and then we, re we reply with a, uh, or sorry, we set up a disconnected function. So um, there's an on close callback that's optional and uh, that will get called whenever there's a disconnect. And the disconnect happens on any of these conditions. Um, we do have a note in here, I believe it's down lower that um, the disconnect may not get called in the current fetch. Uh, node fetch implementation. So um, if you care a lot about that, you can use the uh, HTTP wrapper instead of the fetch wrapper. And that's only when you're using, uh, when you're implementing a client that initiates a request. All this code is for receiving requests. Oh, okay. Giving responses. Good point. Yes, yeah, so that'll be in the Bradify client, not the Bradify server. Cool. Good, okay, so um, we're down to send version. So I wanna just uh, connect the dots here. So send version, um, let's see here. I'm gonna do a search and you can see in the, in the bar here down below, we're looking down uh, up to, yeah, here, sorry. So uh, send version is a function that you can call uh, once you, Deter well, actually, even, even if it's not a subscription, you can still send a version. Um, if, it, if it's not a subscription, then the version will be in the body of the response and it will be a regular HTTP response. So let's explore what send version looks like. Uh, 
Uh, so we're setting up, preparing some functions that we will later call set header and write body. Um, so usually we have either body or patches. I believe that's true in the server as well. Um, in other words, you're either replacing the, con the entire content of something or you are modifying it with patches. So if there's a body, then uh, that body should be a string, not say JSON. And then um, if we are, if it's not a body, then we assume that we have patches and the patches will be, uh, the content of each patch will also be a string not say null or JSON or something like that. And that's so that we can send it out. So this is a very raw, low level library. We're not actually parsing things for you in general uh, or keeping up to date with the latest data. It's just what's on the wire, what's on the protocol. So here we write the headers, virtual headers. Um, in this case means the second level headers, so not the HTTP, HTTP headers, but the um, version or update headers that we're uh, creating. And then we um, loop over each of those entries. Now this data, let's see, I'm a little confused about which data entries we're talking about here. So is this using this as a header? Looks like it is. We have version, parents, patches, and body. Yeah, data is, um, it's an object that contains all of the semantics of a new version. So you've got the version ID, the parents of it, the patches and the body. And up at the top, we extract out the version ID, the parents, the patches, and the body. And then down here, we're also going through uh, other types of headers that you might want to include on this version. Mm -hmm. So you can include some custom headers if you'd like as well. Okay. And what happens to the body in this case? Oh, if header is body. Okay, yeah. so it's sort of like we're pretending it's a header for the purpose of this loop. Yeah, so this is um, this is blacklisting. <laughs> it's going through all of the headers and it's ignoring everything that we're doing something special for. Okay. Okay. So if it's patches or body, then we just continue. Otherwise, we set the header. Great. And this is the final part. We write the. Uh, patches. If it's a patches, if it's body, then we write the body. And um, if there's something wrong, we exit. So, oh, and then there's a final backslash n um, to prepare for the next version. So I think there's basically there's separation that has to be between each of the sets of headers and their bodies uh, or, or patches and the next patch. Um, okay, any questions about Braidify server? Looks clean. I can read it. Yeah. I'll use that to help refine my Python implementation. Yeah. Kudos to Mike. I think this uh, this is very clean, and it's it's gone through several revisions. So I like where it's at. Mm -hmm. Okay. Take a look at the client. Um, the client is more complicated because this is where all the parsing has to happen. Um, so each of the bits of, I guess each of the tiers or levels of headers has to be accounted for and parsed at in its time uh, in the client. So the client, uh, to be clear, can be a client in Node.js or a client in the browser. Um, equally valid for a Braid client to be synchronizing, whether it's a server process or a browser, you know, browser uh, web page. So um, there are a couple of familiar libraries. And I think um, Braidify's goal is to kind of polyfill or expand the capabilities of existing libraries. So we have Braidify HTTP, which is um, a wrapper for the HTTP standard library. 
in node. And then we have fetch, uh, which I believe, yes, it will be down here, braid fetch. So this one is um, wrapping the regular fetch call with some enhanced capabilities to subscribe and patch. Uh, and then this code, this code block here is just to maintain compatibility in each of those environments. So uh, in the case of Node, we have to polyfill or add some extra things that the browser doesn't have, or sorry, that the browser does have. Uh, and um, we also replace fetch with braid fetch on the window when you call this library. So let's take a look here. So uh, I'm actually gonna start with the braid fetch because I'm most familiar with this. If, if anyone wants to go over braid node, uh, sorry, braid HTTP, I think it's braidify HTTP up above, we can do that later. Um, so braid fetch, uh, on this side, so this is the client, we prepare the headers that we're going to send off to the server to get a uh, to, to make a request. So we have version, parents, and subscribe. Um, subscribe in its current form can have a keep alive value, but we're probably changing that. And uh, we don't know what the next form will be. That will be braid 04, but this is braid 03, <laughs> uh, braid HTTP 03 spec. We have some patches. So I suppose this is again, this is the same kind of uh, dichotomy where it's either the body or patches. So if it does have patches, um, we're gonna um, prepare these. Um, this is, so this would be patches that we're making from the client to the server. So uh, this would be a one-time uh, patch. This isn't a subscription of patches. Um, okay. So this is where things start to get a little bit interesting. And um, this has changed recently. So Mike, if you wanna jump in and explain, I wouldn't mind at all, um, but I can go over this slowly as-, as uh, Sure, you could also feel free to ask questions and I could fill in anything you want. You could- You bet. Guide if you'd like. Yeah. So the abort controller is the way that you can um, tell fetch the usual what wig regular fetch to, to stop. Um, so this is uh, basically maintaining compatibility with that, uh, that method. So um, we want, so let's see, this is because we want to be able to abort the fetch that the user passes in. However, the fetch command uses abort controller abstraction to abort fetches, which has both a signal and a controller. It only passes the signal to fetch, but we need the controller to abort the fetch itself. Okay, there you go. Right, yeah, so there's a thing that sends the signal and a thing that receives the signal and we need both. Okay. Um, okay, so this is where we're wrapping the fetch, uh, the original fetch with a promise and what Mike has called a custom promise. So a promise um, doesn't normally have and then, um, but we need something that can regularly send updates and a normal promise sends one update or, or um, awaits and then you can, you can use one update. Uh, after that, there's no guarantee that it will continue. So um, we're gonna wrap up a promise and make a special and then method. Um, <clears throat> so we're starting this promise, getting the normal, the regular fetch. So this is where we are receiving a promise out of the normal fetch. And then um, we are, are then on the first response, which usually would provide the HTTP headers and things, um, we're going to continue uh, re uh, receiving and propagating that information that we receive in the and then function. Um, okay, so I'm looking for the and then function down here. Here it is. So we're, we're creating and then and an iterator uh, if params.subscribe, right. So only in the, in the case of a subscription do we create this. Creating an iterator. Uh, this is the async stuff. I haven't seen this yet. So this is new to me. Creating an async await, await next call. Um, 
Okay, I'm looking for the bottom here. Here we go. Okay, so the promise gets an and then function, which is sort of like an augmented promise. So that's that's the uh, the place where we're actually adding the and then to the promise. It's also be being given this async iterator, which is new to me. That's cool. Okay, so going back up, uh, here we have the start subscription. So once we get a response from the original fetch, then we parse the streamed response. And then we handle results here. Sorry, handle errors here. Oh, actually we do, we have a callback right here. This is the success date. Um, Let's see, callback result, which is, okay, so this is a function being passed into handle fetch stream. I need to just take a look at that to understand it. Yeah, we're looking at, so this code that we're looking at right here is what re, it, 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 it takes the API of fetch and then creates this new API and to create a new kind of promise and also allow for a weight on it if there's a subscription. So in the case where someone calls fetch with a subs with subscribe header, it does some special stuff and then exports this new API. And the code that you're looking at right here is where it's handling either the, uh, a successful new version or an error. And so we're passing and that's the result or the error. And this is getting called into the handle fetch stream function below, which is also you know, there's a bit of code there. Um, just because of the way that fetch works, it returns back this stream of chunks. And then we have to go through that stream of chunks, do some async magic and pull out strings to send to the parser. And so all the parsing code happens below this. And all this stuff, up. this is to deal with the semantics of streams in the fetch, fetch API. And then the code we were just looking at is just the, the fetch function itself, rewriting the arguments in and out while handling errors and promises and asynchronicity. Perfect. Yeah, so we have this subscription parser down here, which I think is what you're talking about. It has the uh, kind of, oh, uh, parse version. Okay, yeah, so this is the overall function and then we, uh, we've split out the parsing into this smaller parse version. Well, it's still quite large, but parse version does the, the heavy lifting for parsing headers and, oh wait, no. Nope. Where is it? Parse version, parse body. This has been cleaned up. Cool. Okay. So let's go back up again so I don't lose everyone. There's parse version, parse headers, and then parse body. Okay. I'm going to have to switch to braid protocol. Um, I don't know if uh, yeah, I think I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep it to an hour. So um, this is uh, this is the end of the Braidify client. We haven't looked at in detail each of these functions, but I think they're pretty clear. We can see here on the outline, um, Braidify HTTP is, uh, sorry, Braid, uh, Braid fetch is what we're looking at at the top that wraps the Braid, or sorry, the regular fetch function. And then we have parse version, parse headers and parse body that we just looked at, which are called inside of handle fetch stream. Okay, any comments, Mike, before we switch over? I want to make sure you get a chance to explain anything that's you're, maybe you're particularly proud of or that there's something uh, that might catch people off guard, either one. Uh, no, that sounds good to me. Uh, I am gonna add some comments to the source code now after getting this user okay. test. <laughs> Super. Okay, um, um, we'll switch over. Uh, yeah. Sorry, but ahead. one very quick question. Can you share yes. some code that uses this Braid of Flight client? I'm just curious to see like what the client looks like. Uh, sorry, what a consumer of yes. this API looks like. Yes. That's Let's a good see question. Here. So Braid uh are we yes? Okay, cool. Uh Okay, 
So array. Where's my braid? Here it is. Okay. So here's an example usage of fetch. Um, fetch call is called on the URL, and then we add this custom code here uh, to tell it that this is a subscribe, not a regular fetch. And then we also provide a signal uh, to abort. And then we call this and then function, which consumes the data uh, one response at a time, one update at a time. And then we call catch on that to get a, to get any error states. And I'm uh, I'm not currently using the cancel. Uh, I, I think it, I used to need to re retain the cancel on the fetch, but I think we use the abort controller now. So that's how we can cancel. Is that what you were looking for? Um, yeah. Thanks. All right, uh, switching over. So this is braid protocol. And again, this is um, organized into client and server. So just the overall structure I'm gonna look at here, excuse me. So we have a client, some examples and the server. The um, readme outlines sort of the goals of the examples and um, the goals of this project, which um, have changed just slightly because I think at first this project was going to tackle um, state synchronization as a whole, but then we're moving uh, the, uh, Seth, correct me if I'm wrong, but the, uh, the more low level braid protocol uh, implementation is gonna be here and the uh, higher level code is gonna move into a different package, I believe. Um, yeah, I'm kind of doing a bit of a monorepo style here where we've got the server and client code in different directories, but each of them will be published as separate NPM packages. So, mm -hmm. um, so the goal is either to have like, yeah, to have a high, high level API for a client as well as the low level API as separate NPM modules. So they might exist as two separate directories inside this folder, um, and then publish separately, or they might be in different, um, different GitHub repos. I'm still not sure about that yet, but yeah. Makes sense. So we might see something like server slash protocol and server slash subscribe, or I don't know, something like that. Something like that, yeah. <laughs> I'd love okay. to hear some questions on naming. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's in flux for sure. Okay, makes sense. All right. So um, the Braid protocol project has uh, is is in TypeScript. So uh, I'm going to start with the types because they're very revealing. I like I like how types can kind of explain a project even without any implementation code. So um, we have a concept of an update, a common update. And uh, this, this, basic, this type basically holds uh, a version and headers. Um, <clears throat> and then a patch ID is also something that is, probably would belong in a higher level library, but for now it's in the low level library. That's not part of the spec. And then uh, we have a snapshot update, which is an update, just like we saw before, a common update. Uh, and it also contains a value. So this can, uh, I believe this is a fairly new change. So correct me if I'm wrong, Seth, but I think this is making it so that a snapshot update can just hold the data as is without any manipulation. It can be the raw data. Yeah, that's right. It's like, that's the new value of the document. Okay. There it is. Cool. And then we have a patch, uh, which can have a type, a range, and some data. And then we have a patch update, which is a common update with a patches key. And the patches key is an array of patch or string or buffs. So um, this allows us, I believe, uh, let's see, instead of full patch objects, if the patch type is specified at the top level. Uh, yeah, it's just so that if you don't have ranges and aren't specifying patch types, because we specified it in the options, then you don't have to wrap all of the patches in an empty like data column thing. Um, it's oh, just that makes sense. Yeah. Thank you. OK, cool. Uh, 
Yeah, so one of the cool things about Braid is that you can take off the shelf sort of pieces of the Braid protocol and mix and match. So in this case, I think what Seth's alluding to here is that a patch may or may not have a range. Uh, so if it doesn't, why, why hold the whole, why contain all of the patch metadata when we just have a string? Uh, so that's, that's what we're simplifying here. And then um, an update, I like this part. Uh, an update is either a shot update or a patch update. So this clarifies uh, to me that at the typing level that an update um, can convey two types of things, one snapshot, the other's a patch, which uh, I think generally is true. It is, it, you could potentially use a, an update in a way that um, patches, but that's kind of off spec. You know, the braid protocol doesn't necessarily provide a way for you to update in the body of an update uh, or to patch in the body of an update. Uh, and then a braid stream is a stream of updates. Perfect. So the braid stream is, is this is a thing that we can, I believe we can async await that. Is that right, Seth? Uh, yeah, that's right. So, yeah. Yeah. Cool. All right, so we're going to look at the uh, stream, the stream uh, file here, which is basically, this is the meat of the uh, server. So, um, you know, it's possible in Braid to use patches on requests, um, but the, the most complicated part, I think, is the streaming. And so a lot of code is dedicated in both the Braid.js and the Braid protocol libraries to how do we stream. So, um, all right, starting at the top. So we have some options that we can pass in to configure our, uh, our stream, our subscription. Um, you have headers, an initial version, and an initial value, which are optional, and a content type for the resource. And then um, you'll see this is this is I think uh, this is the part where it's sort of in flux, probably moving into a higher level library, but maybe not. We're still I think we might might still be deciding that. Um, actually, Seth, do you have any comments on that? I, I'm unfamiliar with this, but I. Uh, uh, sure. Yeah. Well, so, um, so if you think about it, every every patch is either going to be like specifying content ranges and then having the patch content, or it's going to be a custom patch type. If you're using a custom patch type, then usually you'll use the same patch type for every every update. You don't mix and matching different patch types. So, um, I made an issue on the spec saying like, hey, like this is the normal pattern. It's we don't need to specify the patch type for every single patch. Um, so if you decide to do that, if you only want one patch type, then you can just specify the patch type that you're using at the global level, and then you don't have uh, to manually the patch on every patch. Okay, perfect. It's just an option to specify that. Thank you. Yeah, that makes sense. Cool. Yeah, and I can see like a braid type would would come with uh, the range, um, whereas I don't think the other types necessarily do. Right? They they would specify their range in the body of the patch. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Okay, so HTTP headers, straightforward and on close function, and heartbeat seconds. So defaults to 30 to keep the uh, connection alive. Okay. I'm going to skip down to stream. Here we go. So this is where we're generating the braid stream object, which is the thing that we can async await on. So uh, actually, let's look at an example uh, just to clarify this usage. So if we had a server, let's see. Um, Braid.stream. OK, so here's the braid stream. And uh, you can append values to the braid stream. In this case, this is an example that's just updating with a, I believe it's a timestamp. So one second, one second, one second, we get a new update with the value. So this is, uh, uh, it looks like we're able to append JSON. So that's kind of a nice high level thing. Uh, probably something that's still in flux de determined, you know, is it which, at which point in the library do we do that? But um, I think this is a very reasonable, good looking way to add uh, append to a stream. 
So um, let's take a look at this. So stream is being created from our uh, options that we were just looking at and a server response. So we would need to be in the, in the server code, like in a Express.js middleware or in a get request or something like that, where, we're, uh, where we have access to this response. Then we check the headers. If it's a subscribe, if it's not a subscribe, then we send just the initial value and then close the connection. So we return here. But if it is a subscribe, then we handle the rest here. So um, some cache control headers, default things, connection keep alive. Uh, I believe there's also a uh, content encoding chunk being sent somewhere. Um, yeah, uh, the Node.js HTTP library will add that automatically if you don't okay. specify a content right. uh, like in the headers. OK, perfect. So that's where it's getting added. Um, I think that's the case on Bray.js as well, which I just didn't see it. And I was curious. Uh, content type. Here we're setting the content type. Again, this is the uh, patch type that was talked about earlier. So sort of a global setting. And then we continue with the subscription, responding with the 209. And here we create this async stream. Now this is, uh, this is based on the mini async or mini stream iterator library, which is a very small library that creates async a weightable chunks or things that can be um, generated. So here we're creating this stream and we're specifying that this, these are the types of things that can be in the stream. And <clears throat> here's the close function. Uh, if something, if the stream is closed, then we mark it as connected false and we end the response. And then uh, let's see, we have the stream object which I want to follow. So here, here we go. So here's where the stream object is being iterated. So we for a wait it. Uh, let's see. So this would be receiving receiving updates from the client. We're looking at what updates it has. So this is for a subscription. So the user code is calling append to append new things to the stream. So the, the ah, um, there we go. The Thank you. Saying, yeah, append this update. Append this update, and then now we're going to consume all of the updates and send them off to the to the to the browser. Okay. Thank you. Yes. So there's no uh, at, in between this stream iterator and the um, the API usage of the stream. There's no braid specific stuff happening in this case. It's just putting a thing on and then consuming it here. Is yeah, that right? That's right. Okay, great. Is this in the client or the server we're looking at right now? This is the server. Yeah, so that's just to clarify, um, we're not for a waiting here to, um, to wait on like a, uh, a stream coming from Node.js or something like that. This is just a stream that's being used uh, as a as an intermediate holding place for things that need to be appended and then uh, um, sequentially handled. So then we handle these headers. If it's a snapshot, then we send the data as the body. And if it's a patch, if it's a set of patches, then we need to tell it that the patches header has a certain length. So patches one, patches two, something like that. And then in each patch, we will send um, a new header set. This is the third tier of headers with content length as the uh, required header. And everything else will be optional headers <clears throat> like content range um and potentially others uh you, you can you know there's nothing stopping you from adding other headers to a patch but i think that's those are the main ones 
Um, these, these headers, by the way, are under consideration for change. They may become patch length and patch range. We'll see. Uh, maybe patch type. Uh, yeah, and then um, we write that we write all of those messages as a buffer and um, and flush. Cool. So if there oh, and then there's this last part. If there's initial value is undefined, then we append a stream. Why would that be? Let's see. So if the initial the, value. Or if you specify an initial value, um, then the stream will just automatically pick that up initially and uh, send that. Uh, I see. So this is this is called on behalf of the calling code. Oh, oh, well, as what I'm thinking of is calling code. So we had this example of the uh, stream.append being used here, right? And you're saying that that happens for you automatically if you've got an initial value. Yeah, that's right. Cool. OK. Super. All right, I think um, our time is pretty close to up here. Uh, I do want to just briefly show the client. Um, so skip ahead. So this is the client code. Um, there is a state machine here, which makes it a little bit more complicated again. Uh, same as Braid.js, we need to be able to track, are we handling an update? Are we handling patches inside of an update? And then um, for an update, we need to be able to handle the headers versus the content, and then the patch headers versus the patch content. So uh, we append and generate, in this case, using an async generator, um, these HTTP chunks. And then <clears throat> these updates are passed to a subscribe function that um, you can use. In this case, this is subscribe raw. And uh, that's the equivalent of the Braid.js is subscribe um, because this is the lowest level. Um, subscribe raw also uh, is used later here to create a, high, a slightly higher level subscribe uh, down here. So there's a subscribe function. This is again an async function. So you can um, async a weight on it. And oh, sorry, for a weight on it. And these um, versions or updates are more complete. So there's more, there are more options here that we, we can have like complete snapshots. Um, I think, does this have the catch up code, up to date code, or is that later? No, I don't know. I've left it as you changed it, Dwayne. So oh, okay. the change in this, in this wrapper around uh, subscribe raw is that um, we're just going to pause some more headers. We're going to pause the, um, the content type of patches and the data and so on. So the subscribe raw will just give you buffers. I mean, it'll give you uh, you and eight arrays for the patches and for the um, the data itself. Okay. Uh, but the subscribe function will you know give you a JSON object if it's JSON and so on. Ah, thank you. Okay, that's the difference. Nice. So it's going to listen to these content type headers and then based on that parse the document. Okay. Great. Okay, I think that's time. Um, there's obviously more we could cover, uh, but I, I think that's enough. I don't, I don't want to bore everyone too much. <laughs> um, can you just quickly show the client in one of the examples? Just yes, to... certainly. That's so cool. here, uh, here we have a client example. So very nice API. Um, there's a four a wait on updates. So whenever the uh, whenever the subscribed updates come through, each one will in turn be handled. Any so questions? How much less code there is in the example uses than in the code itself. Yeah. It's designed for a library. It's like, glad we wrote a function to abstract that one. Yes. Yes. And I, yeah, I can't wait for the day when we have. Uh, variables that feel local that's going to be even more incredible <laughs> but yes it proves the proves the value of it okay i'm trying to stop share oh. stop there. here we go okay i think that's it if there's no no more questions that's all i've got
I have a question. You uh, did you show us a lower level client server and then a higher level client server, oh. or vice versa? So these are two libraries that have slightly different goals and values, but they're they're core like they're they're both implementing this the spec uh, HTTP zero three or HTTP braid. Sorry, I got that backwards. Braid HTTP zero three. So they were they aren't necessarily higher or lower level. They're both um, doing the same kinds of things. Like let me subscribe to a stream of updates or a stream of patches. Let me send a patch. Let me send uh, an update. So you would use one or the other? Yeah. Um, you have a choice. What's mm -hmm. the What's the difference? Yeah. Um, so the basic, the gist to it is that Braid.js is um, more, I would say its values are more around agility and changing um, so that we can experiment with the spec. Uh, and then I would say Braid protocols values are more around like, uh, like a high quality library that has tests and uh, is, you know, well typed and things like that. Okay. I would say there are two libraries written by different people who have different programming styles. And um, I would say, look at the one that you like the programming style of the best. Of the best. Um, definitely want to have types or uh, tests and stability in Braid.js and Braidify too. Um, but uh, I usually don't write with static types. And so there's no TypeScript. Um, yeah, Rafi Rock, uh, Walker wrote the first version of that code. but. Um, yeah, I, don't, I wouldn't say there's any sense to it other than, hey, we're writing multiple implementations. Let's see if we can get them to work together. And in the process, we're also developing our own ideas of what it's like to build it, to build, implement the spec. Okay. Yeah. I think that's important to point out <laughs> that uh, two, yeah, two separate sort of approaches to the same thing. Um, interop or what is it, plurality you know, win. So I get it. Cool. And um, they should be compatible with each other as well. Um, I haven't tested it, but yeah. Uh, and yeah, and that's right. Like my project, Braid.js, I wrote Braid Protocol. That's, <laughs> that's the biggest difference in my mind. So which one are you working on, Dwayne? Both? I've looked and, and used, looked at and used both. Um, right now I'm using Braid.js for ribbon. Uh, but I think it's, there aren't good reasons that I did that. I flipped between both of them and they were just different capabilities that I needed at various stages of their development. So that's where I'm at right now. Got it, cool. And I also like both Mike and Seth and don't want to uh, you know, be enemies. Sorry to put you in that position to answer that question. <laughs> cool. I wrote my own. But it's yeah. <laughs> I talk about plurality. <laughs> cool. Well, I think uh, if, if there is, if there aren't any other questions, does anyone else have anything they want to add? I think we're good for time. So, um, I briefly want to mention around the um, Angela, you asked about high and low level. Um, as I see it, like I think the API you actually kind of want to consume as a client is often just like give me all the values um, in the document. You don't really care about like, oh, now I've got an update. Now I've got, you know, now the whole document's been replaced now, whatever. Um, so when I think about like a high level API, that's what I'm thinking about. Like, you know, something like that, maybe with the ability as well to be able to call a method and say, hey, I, you know, I've got a patch too. Like, can you send this back to the server? Um, so yeah, there's another function further down in that client code that I want to pull out into a separate library, which does much more of that. And it's much more complicated. Like it's actually applying all the patches. Um, which the other libraries, the other, which, which the raw subscription doesn't do. So the, the raw subscription is just like, tell me what was sent over the HTTP connection. Whereas like, yeah, high level wrapper is like, just tell me all of the, tell me whenever my document changes, tell me the new value so I can render it on the screen. Um, so I've got a, a wrapper function that does that, but um, yeah. That yeah, sense. in the Braid.js code, there's the kernel is that higher level API that applies patches and tells you what the current state of the object is. And then the Braidify code is just, well, let's Braidify existing HTTP code, which is low level. It's just speaking request response world. 
Another interesting use case I've run into, Seth, is uh, um, forwarding patches, essentially. So um, I, uh, in Ribbon, have a situation where I want a feed to represent a collection of several things, several arrays, basically. And so whenever, whenever one of these arrays changes, I also want to patch the kind of the holding, the containing array. It's, it's basically a flat, think of it as like a flattened array. So if, if any one of its containing array, contained arrays changes, I also want to update the, the main thing. So it's, it's kind of an interesting situation where I don't necessarily want to send a snapshot of the thing every time it changes, but I want, I want to pay attention to the individual patches and then say, where did this fit inside of the containing array? And can I, can I forward a patch that way? In this case, uh, I don't care where it fits inside the containing array because I know I know it's always an append. But um, the general case might be uh, like forward a patch or something like that. Yeah, I implemented something like that when I was doing Statecraft, and I thought about it as like it, you've got a mapping function from you know from some data to some other data, and then you need to take that mapping, so the mapping from like you know this model to this other model. Um, and then convert all the patches as well as convert the data itself, you know, when you got new values. Um, yeah, yeah, that's a cool, interesting case. Uh, I, I was mm -hmm. going back and forth on whether to have the same, use the same types for describing updates for both the server and the client. And I ended up not doing that because in the server, um, when you're creating an update, actually you want to provide as little as possible. Like I want the type to be easy to produce. And then in the client, I just want to like throw as many fields on it as, as possible, you know, as anyone might possibly want so that it's really feature rich, but obviously someone making an update shouldn't have to add all those extra fields if they don't care about them. Um, but anyway, I'm still not sure about that, but for your use case, it'd be really nice if that was the same type, right? Because like, you know, here I've got a, a proxy, a braid proxy, and all it does is when it gets a connection in, it makes a connection out using the client library and then forwards all of the updates across. But um, I don't think the types are currently compatible, which feels mm -hmm. a bit embarrassing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good points. Cool. I think that's it. Thanks for everyone for joining, watching, uh, watching two various ways of doing braid in concrete JavaScript code. Visible progress. I like it. <laughs> good stuff. So when can we see something on NPM? Uh, Braidify is on NPM right now. OK. How about client client code? Client and server. Oh, okay. Although I don't, how would you get the client? I don't know how to do, it's there. I don't know how to use NPM for client code. I always just grab the JavaScript file itself and link it with a script tag, but I think Dwayne knows how. Yeah, I need. I still need to test the latest version of it, but uh, it, uh, it's built to work in any environment we just, need to test it more in in several environments like the like browser uh, bundled browser is one scenario we haven't tr tried it yet um the braid protocol code error does work in bundled browser code so that example one is a variant of it that does works in a browser um you can see how that's bundled um just using browser f5 but it should work with any of the others uh i should actually publish it to npm there um there's no reason why it's not and yeah maybe i'll just do that today um and that would be two separate npm mo modules one for the client and one for the server so then if you're wanting to do browser code or like client code, you would pull in the client version of the NPM library. Um, and the bundled, like the created bundled JavaScript code is pretty small. It ends up just being a couple K. So yeah. Cool. I'll try them both if I, when I get around to it, because I was just right now in my own brain, right? When you posted this chat, <laughs> posted this to chat. So uh, I should be able to slot it in at least from what I saw. And I'll report back any errors. <laughs> cool. Good timing then. One last question. Where does sync nine lie in this? Is that a kernel? Sync nine is a, uh, sometimes like to call it a merge algorithm or a synchronizer algorithm. And so you've got the kernel. Kernel, um, in my mind, I've got, I've got a kernel. The kernel can speak a lot of different network protocols. It can also speak with a bunch of different merge algorithms. And it can, OK, so you can plug in a merge algorithm. You can plug in a network protocol into the kernel. And you can also plug in a persistence database storage. 
and you can plug in validator functions and you can plug in reactive updates or user interfaces to that too. Okay, okay. Kernel's big time. <laughs> Good, okay. So what kernel do you have going right now? Uh, there is a kernel folder inside of the Braid.js repo. Mm -hmm. And it is like a prototype. I, it's not packaged up, it's not documented. Um, it's basically, we built whatever infrastructure we needed to build to have Sync9 working and build a couple apps with it. And it provides some basic features. Okay, all right, it's all making sense now. Cool. Cool. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Talk again soon. Thanks, Dwayne. Really appreciate it. See you guys. You bet. Bye, guys. Thank you.